know one thing. Wherever we go, this family is our fortress. Hello, everyone. I'm Perry Nemroff with Collider, and it is an honor to get to talk to the Academy Award nominated sound team behind Avatar The Way of Water. Please join me in welcoming supervising sound editor Gwendolyn Yates Whittle. Congratulations, Gwen. Hi, thank you. We also have re recording mixer, supervising sound editor, and sound designer Christopher Boys. Yay. How you doing? Hello. We have a re-recording mixer, Gary Summers. Yay! Re-recording mixer, Michael Hedges. Hey, how you doing? We have production sound mixer, Julian Howarth. Hello! Yeah. And we will also have supervising sound editor, Dick Bernstein, joining us as well. Congratulations to all of you. I hope this will come across during our conversation, but what you accomplish on this movie is a feat that cannot be well represented in a mere 20 to 30 minute conversation right now. So my God, hats off to you all right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So I got a little bit of a group question to start with here, but Chris, I'll, I'll ask you to answer this one first, but I wanted to pose a question to all of my avatar returnees. So that would be Chris, Gwen, uh, Gary and Dick. Thank you. Can each of you pinpoint something about your experience working on avatar that proved useful on the way of water? But then on the other hand, can you also give me something about your approach to your work that required a, an overhaul or some sort of evolution in order to tackle the challenges that the way of water posed? Yeah, well, I mean, the, as we all know, in Avatar 2, we arrive at our story in, in an environment that we're really used to, the Pandoran jungle. And, and so that was um, really like a sort of a revisit and 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 an old friend this world that we created of of this this beautiful jungle all around us and then of course we get transported to the um Metkaina village on on the coastal waters of the, of the planet of pandora which was a completely different environment for us and and um in the world of avatar the environment is a very big character of the sound and so the world that we created in avatar 1 while we visited it early on in the film in Avatar 2, when we went to the coast, we were in a whole new environment. And then we went into a whole nother environment when we went underwater. So um, it really, in, in, way, in, in certain ways, the environment changed radically three different times for us. The first time being a revisit of Avatar 1 um, in terms of sort of approach or technology, I think... Um, on on Avatar One, I I created a lot of sounds on my Synclavier, and on um, <laughs> Avatar Two, I was challenged in ways that um, made me stretch my muscles differently, and and I used uh, a little bit of the Synclavier, and I used uh, a lot of other tools that um, provided me some really cool opportunities. First one was probably a little bit more traditional and workflows for me. It was more, um, we did a lot more sort of regular ADR. We did a lot more of um, kind of traditional loop group stuff. Um, this one for a wide variety of reasons, we had little kids, we had the pandemic, we had all sorts of things kind of just kind of tossing the workflows up, up in the air a lot. Um, also the water and the sort of the complications of recording people in water is a uh, much it's just a bigger challenge than recording people in, in in just normal air kind of thing so those are the kind of the big things jim's directive stayed clarity is king you have to hear the dialogue you've got to hear the s's you got to hear the breaths you've got to stay with your characters if you know if they're a big battle scene you can't lose who you're who you're following in there those things stayed the same so the Jim Cameron-ness of it was still very consistent, but kind of the, how we worked around the technology that he 
pushed to the limits affected how I did my job? I, I would say my work, my process was pretty much the same. I know, you know Gwen and, and um, Julian had to deal with different things, um, you know, be with the water and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, how I ha handled the dialogue in the mix was pretty much the same way we did in the first film, you know. They were, they were extraordinarily different. Uh, in the first film, I was the uh, second music editor under Jim Henriksen, and James Horner was the composer. We had a large music team. It was stable. We had a house in Malibu that we were working out of. Uh, the mix was, uh, you know, the mix was more similar in the sense that it was problem solving, but we had much fewer options with the music. Uh, and this time around, Simon Franklin was the composer. We were, it was an extremely stripped down music team. There were times when Simon was alone by himself in the studio for days on end with no support at all. And, uh, and my role had changed a lot. I was, I was more of a, uh, a go-between than on the first one. Uh, what stayed the same was problem solving. Uh, I, I, I guess what, one other big difference was that uh, Jim had access to the music earlier and with many more stems, uh, individual instruments split out so that he could turn things on and off. And uh, so it just got kind of exponentially more complicated. But the... And, and, and yeah, there were just fewer options the first time around. Uh, the orchestra was actually in one track, the entire orchestra. And this time, because of COVID rules, we recorded the strings, the brass, and the percussion all separately. So right there, things were different. And then Simon had umpteen synthesizer sample tracks that were separate. Uh, so it was tough. And, and Mike... Uh, I guess Mike wasn't around the first time, but he, he held it all together. We, we were spread out hugely in Pro Tools, and uh, he made the sounds which came from... There was music from the first film in the second film uh, with all the original stems, and Mike made it sound like it was all the same movie. All right, Michael and Julian, I'll come to you next as the uh, as the Avatar first timers here. When you first joined the production, what was the very first time that maybe you stopped and said to yourself, like, okay, this is going to be like nothing I've ever done before? And, and maybe even like, how am I ever going to pull this off? I started in 2017. The first time I thought is what, what, am, what am I doing? was uh, literally the first minute as I walked on stage and you just walked on and it was coming to set up and walking in and they were like, listen, it's a nice, simple day. We're going to get get things to an off and we'll... And at that point, I was like, what am I doing? Am I, I, do they know who I am? I, 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 am I up to this? And then uh, you, we set up and then I remember that then, then Jim walked on stage and said, I want to do this and started to talk about what he wanted to do. And then it was like, okay, I'd need to just keep up. I just need to keep up. And it was then like, can I keep up? You know, I think there was constant doubt about whether you can keep up, but that also pushed me to be, I'm, I'm going to keep up actually. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have to, because it's, you just have to keep going. You have to keep going at Jim's pace. And he comes up with ideas that you just have to cope with. And you just have to say, you know, it's just like he says, I want to go to a 30 foot deep water tank. And I want to communicate with actors and I want to hear talking and we're going to have machines putting a current through it and we're going to have waves six foot tall. And you go, how long have I got to prepare for that? And they're like, six months. Good luck. And so then you just and then you're off and you're just trying to keep up with Jim. Um, and, and, and it's and at that point, it's enthralling. I suppose it's like, you know, it's a roller coaster ride. You, you, there's, there's trepidation and then there's excitement as you reach the top and then there's a the thrill as you're thundering down the hill at the other side. So it's everything all at once. Yeah. Yeah. I'll follow on. I think um, for me, being the new kid on the block, as, as Jim called me on the first day, it was, um, it was quite an event. Uh, I, I, I thought I was prepared, but I don't think I was. Um, the, the teamwork that um, we experienced on Avatar was superb. Without any one of these fine people, this track would not have happened. And, and Simon Franklin um, had time with Jim. Uh, and and when, it, when it came to the stage, as Dick said, we had a myriad of tracks. I, uh, we started off with one sort of technology and ended up changing it all out to Pro Tools S6s and, 
and without that, we would never have been able to get through uh, the process. So um, I think the, the beauty of it all is Jim knows precisely what he wants. And the Avatar score, the Avatar soundtrack, the picture, everything is the way that Jim wanted it. And he would not have it any other way. Um, and, the, and the complicating factor is that we had so much to choose from, so many things. It was, as Chris will probably say later, it's all about what's not in the track that makes Avatar so special. Oh my, I have so many follow-up questions and so many specifics I want to hit. I guess, I guess I'll throw this one to you, Chris and Gwen. I, I really would love to hear a little bit about the development of the Talkoon language. Maybe specifically to get us started with that, what would you say is the biggest difference between how you thought that language would sound day one when starting to create it and what you wound up with in the finished film? That that would be a um that it was a marathon. Uh, to honest honestly, uh, I don't know. Maybe twenty seventeen, I started making Tolkien sounds here at Skywalker, um, and I I spent about two three weeks uh, working with every marine vocal that I could find within my library and Skywalker's library and, and commercial libraries. And we, and then, then my son and I, and, and Lucas Miller, my assistant, we, we went to uh, Hawaii and recorded humpbacks. Um, so we, I built this huge library of marine mammal sounds and then put it, put it aside, put it in the avatar library, which um, I didn't, well, so I put it in the Avatar library. Dave Kraska, who was helping me build this library, made it available to the picture department. And and then the dialogue started, ha the conversation around what the Tolkien should be started happening largely with John Landau and I, the producer. And um, so then I went down so many off ramps trying to come up with something that would evoke language all the the emotion of happiness of sadness and everything in between of rage and pain and um gwen and i uh we, we employed some young kids with really interesting accents and vocals um we we used kevin dorman who actually performed sort of a tolkoon character on the set um and this went on for a long time what about this what do you think of this what do you think of this and then in the end, when we finally sat, when I finally sat down with Jim at Park Road and played him the, my first pass of the, the, the first meeting of Loak and Piacon in the film, he said, whoa, 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 what, what am I hearing? What, what about what I already heard? And I said, I said, okay, what did you already hear? Well, he had taken that library that I built back in 2017 and worked with it and cut something that he really liked. And he said, well, let's work with that as a basis. So I went back to that, modified it a little bit, and then represented it to him. And then he said, okay, now let's get creative because I feel like we're hitting all the points, but I feel like now we have an opportunity to build even further. And that's when I went back to the drawing board and I created these sort of um, flourishes that included whistles and, and kind of call outs that, that were meant to evoke happiness. So the language of the Tolkien has been the biggest challenge of my career. And um, I hope it comes through clearly in the film because I'm very proud of it. And it was a very, very long story to get there. The fact that I walked away from the movie feeling like Piacon was one of my favorite characters among a very large ensemble of very well-drawn characters should speak to how effective your work is in this particular oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean it, I mean it. Um, Gwen, I'll go, I'll go to you on something that I know you focus on strongly, the, the dialogue. And I know as I'm asking this question, everybody could probably chime in dependent on uh, how you come into the production. But of all the characters in this movie, which one would you say had dialogue that was most difficult or challenging to see through to fruition for like a, like a myriad of reasons that I could list out right now? It's not because his performance was his performance was fantastic, but it's mostly the character of Loak because he was always in that tank with plastic balls on top of the water. And so getting rid of those plastic balls and preserving the, the, the true essence of his performance and his character, 
uh, we we used we used uh, Julian's production. We used ADR. We used this program called Mal, and we just used all the tools we had. We used FPR, which is Jim's version of face and face and ADR together at the same time, which Julian recorded as well. Um, we used all those things to 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 keep Loak as a complicated and and charming uh, character as he was when they shot him. So he was he was the hardest, but it was purely for technical reasons, not because because of him. It was it was, it was purely the environment because um, lo, you know majority of Loak and, and and his relationship and all that development was filmed in our water tank, which was, I, th- I can't remember how many, 100,000 gallons our, our body was, but it was huge, 30 foot depth. And to enable performance capture under the water and at the surface, um, it's a series of cameras that get light reflections. And the worst thing you can do in water is the surface of water is just one giant mirror. So to eliminate that from when we were filming, we had to cover the surface of the water in what, what we would best describe as about 10,000 ping pong balls. I, it probably it probably is Dick. it probably is and it sounded horrific um you know and, and and at this point it was like okay i have to at which point we have to mic as close as we can to the mouth to kind of give a noise to uh the signal le- signal to noise level that, you, that gwen can work with um and it's and wild tracks and instead fbr but you know all the performances were in that tank and so it was like gwen's job to dig that out and the performances are beautiful and, and 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 thank goodness for Gwen's work that that gets cleaned up because he's like I can only present what's there in the in the moment of where I am. You're in the fit of of, of peak and and everything's happening. So I, all I can do is record what we've got there and get as best as I can. And then it's down to Gwen and 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 Gary to kind of clean this and present it up. And it's amazing. You can't tell. I don't think you can tell Gwen. And you've mentioned this before. What's production? What's ADR? What's FPR? And what's Mal? You cannot tell which is which. I also had brilliant dialogue editors helping me. It was not just me. It was Marty and Helen and Ray, and they are fantastic at their job. So it was not just me. But the you know the team and how they did that was was just amazing. But you know the problem was environment. It was a plastic balls. It was water. It was we had underwater speakers that were playing playback to actors that were underwater. We had other props that were in the water. We had a turbine that would create a 15 knot current through the water. And we also had a giant um, uh, dis- water displacer that would make waves. So as is, is with Pyacan, is in the open sea and there's a wave. And to create that, you have this big metal wedge that is coming in and out of the water to create the wave in the tank. So the movement is realistic. And so all that is just, it's, it's, it's your worst nightmare as the production sound maker. Gary, I'll, I'll go to you next to build on this little of everything Julian just listed, what was like challenge number one, something you thought was going to be a red flag that you would all never be able to overcome? Well, I'll have to say that, I mean, hearing Julian describe how caustic the environment was and everything that was there. And by the time Gwen and her crew took it, by the time it came to me, I never knew any of all that. They had cleaned it up. They had fixed it. I'm serious. It was, um, very well done. Uh, there wasn't much from that those things that I had to deal with at all. My my job was to put it into this on the screen, make it sound natural, make people believe that they're right there with those characters. But again, you, both Julian and Gwen and the crew did a fantastic job because I wasn't, you know, there wasn't much of that stuff that I had to clean up. It had already been done. It had already been taken care of, and I'm just dealing with the voice putting the voice into the movie, weaving it around Mike's music and, and um, you know, Chris's effects and things like that. So excellent job on their part. You guys are all so quick to praise each other. And I love the crossover happening in departments here. It's unprecedented. I, I, this, is, this is such a great team and it's something that gives me absolute joy. Every time we see, we've done this quite a few times where you sit and we're all on screen. And there's I, it's joy when I know you're coming in to see them all again. It's true joy to kind of see them all again and to, to be with them. It's brilliant. 
I'm going away from specifics now, but I kind of wanted to get everyone's take on this too. Given given all of the opportunities you have to work with other folks in the sound department that you usually don't get to collaborate with directly and maybe beyond that as well, can each of you name a member of the crew that you got to collaborate with closely on the way of water that you traditionally wouldn't on another type of production? I'll start with that one. My collaboration was, so it was filmed in two separate continents, two, two separate hemispheres of the world we filmed in manhattan beach in la and we also then we packed everything up into pelican cases giant cases and we shipped everything out to new zealand to finish it off with live action and so the collaboration for me which i don't normally get there's this twofold one is i don't normally collaborate with post we film you speak to post to make sure we post production make sure it's coming through okay and something we can do but there was a huge amount of collaboration post filming with post production with gwen with doing eight recording ADR, which is something I've never done and and I hugely enjoyed. Um, but my collaboration was with the other production sound mixer, Tony Johnson, who worked uh, down in New Zealand, who came to see us for two weeks. And we just sat together to go through costumes about how we're gonna mic spider, how we built the masks and, and everything was this huge collaboration and to pass on to him. And then to see the same terror in his eyes as I had in my first day, when he first came up for his first day, it was great. And I'm like, listen, it's going to be okay, and 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 it was. I mean, Tone TJ is incredible at his job, and that's a collaboration I don't normally get is with other production sound mixers, and that was something unique, um, and and it's something that I really loved, and, I, and I'll hold close to my heart with Tony. You know, I think back to the three films that I've supervised and sound designed for James Cameron, and on each of the three films, I've had to go to someone and say would you do this? And before you say yes, understand that your life is going to be different after you finish it. I'm going to ask you to take your life as you know it right now and turn it upside down, move to a new location and be under a tremendous amount of pressure for a long time. And on Avatar 2, Avatar 1, I had Addison Teague move to LA. He's there today. I had on Avatar 2, I had Dave Kratzka move from Oakland to Manhattan Beach, where he and I started the post-production sound design, and he's there today. And and he came down to New Zealand and worked with me down there, along with Brent Burge, who I established a relationship with when I first met Hedgie 20 plus years ago on Lord of the Rings. So... um. I could go on about my team. My team was unbelievable. And it wasn't just, oh, hey, here's a great job. We're going to work for Chris. It was, oh, my life is going to change. I, and I'm going to put, in terms of, in, in Dave's case, I'm going to put four years of my life on hold, move to a new town, and then move to a new country. And so um, no small ask. And and uh, I have to say between uh, the the Americans that came down and the Kiwis who have a long relationship, who are my, my brothers and sisters down there. Uh, I couldn't have done this film without them. Sort of on that same note, because I usually work with Skywalker crews because I work for Skywalker sound working with the, um, the New Zealand crew. I didn't know any of them at all. And so you're, I was hiring people. I had no idea who they were. I'd never worked with them. I didn't know their work ethic. I didn't know if we were going to be on the state page with how to lay everything out. And, um, I just, I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with Parker Post and my, I, my God, I'd work with Helen and Marty and Ray any day, anytime, anywhere on Pandora, any, anywhere on Mars. They were, they were so uh, solid and collaborative and supportive and it was amazing. But I also do have to give a shout out to the incomparable Marco Alisea who uprooted his life and left his small children and his wife and came down to New Zealand with us to make sure that we, uh, he was our first assistant. He brought all the countries together and all the departments together. And he, he, he was a solid member of the team. I'll jump in too, because um, as a music scoring, uh, re-recording mixer, working closely with Dick and Darren Hall um, was something fantastic. But the other person, Simon Franklin, who was down in New Zealand for a year composing this incredible score to have the contact and the flexibility to be able to bounce ideas off Simon that Jim wanted to do and change, 
was made made it um, a, 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 an achievable project because without without that close collaboration, there's no way we would have got through um, this this huge score, this whole three and a bit hours. And, and Simon will tell you he re, he wrote over five hours of score. Um, it was huge. But but the, to have everyone on site at Park Row Post in New Zealand that turned around and as Gwen and Chris have said, Park Road is full of the most incredible technical and creative people that you would find on the planet. And um, it was such a joy working with you, Dick and, and Darren, um, who, who we grabbed. <laughs> he came from the scoring stage in LA, thought he was coming for a couple of days, had no clothes. He turned up in New Zealand and we kept him for about three months. It was hilarious. And he went from summer to winter. He didn't have the right clothes. <laughs> we didn't just grab him from LA. He, he came from England. And he was in L.A. for the scoring session, and we grabbed him while he was in L.A. and brought him to New Zealand. Yeah, Darren, Darren is a guy who I had never met before, uh, except in Zoom calls. And we got to be extremely good friends. He's a very good technical music editor. And uh, we took walks every day and hung out and all that. But I think, I think your question was about really working with people who we would not ordinarily work with. And in my case, it's the people here on screen because uh, they're not in the music department. So starting with Julian on the set and, uh, and and doing playback with him and making friends there. And then really, we we were together so long and under such intense circumstances that I really got to know all these guys well. We really had to support each other. We couldn't have gotten through it without that. And, uh, you know, this is my new family. So... Uh, and, and they're sound people. I mean, music and sound usually don't uh, <laughs> don't play well together, but we had to. We totally had to, and uh, it worked out super well. And I'm so glad. And and like they said, it's it's a joy to have these conversations, not for the interview, but just to see everybody's face again. Got that vibe the second I signed on this call. <laughs> My part, uh, I had been in, at Park Road Post prior to this, Chris got me involved on some of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit films. So I knew Mike, I knew all the folks there and it was, it was awesome to go back and um, work with them again. But, um, and the dialogue crew that Gwen had awesome people, you know, just ev everything was, you know, just laid out for me to do my thing. I, I it, it was, it was very well, very well carried out. One person that I know really helped you out a lot, Gary, is Lex, Lex Federal. Yeah, Lex is one of the mixed techs at Park Road. And uh, he, w because of the demands of Mike, Chris, and I, some of the print mastering and, and all that kind of stuff um, needed to be done. And so Lex, he took care of that for us. Um, we would check it and everything, but I remember he was doing the IMAX print master and uh, they said, well, you should go over and take a listen to it, you know, Five minutes into it, I'm like, keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome. <laughs> it was fine. It was great to have Lex because it was a whole huge process that we didn't have to think about, that we knew he was going to carry it out and it was going to be great. And uh, you can hear people t talking about seeing it in IMAX. They're loving it. So I have to let you all go soon. And I needed like a full day to highlight all the little details that are on my list right now. In order to maximize our time, I'm going to end with another group question so each of you can maybe pinpoint something specific that we could see of yours in the film. But in all of the interviews I, I've ever heard for a James Cameron film, I always hear his collaborators emphasize how specific he is about literally everything. So can you each tell me about a time when that specificity of his pushed you maybe it was hard to meet that but you did and it wound up being a push that helped you exceed your own expectations for your work i, I think that if, if you jim works that way and he is very specific he'll he, we mix the film a shot at a time he'll look at the shot and that what sound is important in that shot and there's lots of sounds you're not going to play you're going to play the narrative sounds that are going to tell the story and uh there, specifically, we went into the first swim, okay? It's a big music sequence, big 3D effects and everything. As they breathe in before they go underwater, how important the breath was. It became, I had no idea. 
But when you hear Jim articulate the scene and, and explain those breaths that Loak and the brother take before they go under, you got to hear them because that's part of what we're, that's the story. They can't breathe and the other people can, and they're teaching them how, and, and just things like that. Small things that you would, when you first watch the scene, they, you just gloss over them. When Jim comes in and articulates it, you realize there's details that you're missing that are important and he wants them taken care of. That is a very good example right there. There was a, there was an action sequence, uh, very, very busy, uh, when the ship is sinking and people are all split up and we're cutting between three different things and we get to one particular shot. I think it was about four and a half seconds long and Jim decided it needed another piece of music. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so we just had to jump in there and swap out. He's like, you know, the, the thing we heard earlier, that would work really well on this shot. It's like, okay, uh, but, you know, this is, this is it's a surgery. You have to cut it in and, and make it sound like it was meant to be there and composed that way. I saw the film recently in, in an IMAX theater. I didn't even notice, you know, the, 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 the changing of horses that happens with music all the time. Uh, but that was, that was Jim pushing me to, to solve another big problem. I think, I think uh, one thing that we experienced on Avatar uh, quite extensively is, is exactly what Gary and Dick and, and uh, everybody saying, uh, you know, Jim, in a typical film, when a big epic music comes along as a sound effects guy, you're going to broom a lot of stuff and maybe gingerly put in a little piece here and a little piece there. And with Jim, it's not that way. I mean, he's like, okay, the music is carrying this piece, but guess what? He may say, we're going to have a couple of sound effects, but what we have is an articulated hundreds of sound effects, handing one off to the other, and, and, and Hedgy is taking the music and pulling the percussion out so that the guns can play, and, and, and then, you know, when we're underwater swimming, we're going to hear those tail swishes. We're going to hear these people swimming in such a way that it doesn't take away of the majesty of the music, but it supports the visual, and that's something the biggest challenge on a James Cameron film is he's not going to just present music and visuals. He's going to present a movie of all these, these pieces that have to work in orchestration with one another. And it's uh, like Gary said, telling a story a shot at a time. For me, uh, and it, it started with Julian, what you did with Zoe recording her song. Um, and to me, that sets the scene right at the beginning of the movie. We see and we hear just this beautiful um, song that Zoe sings and puts you in a totally different space. It tells the story of new birth. And then at the end of the film, where we, where we see the funeral sequence and we hear the song, and I know that it brings tears to a lot of people's eyes, but that was classic James Cameron, where he, on set, he got, he got the emotion, he got the feel, he got this beautiful song performed, and we were able to capture that in the movie without doing a lot of work to it, and that's thanks to Julian. But to me, it really spoke of the moment, and as Chris said, there are, there are effects happening under there that you aren't even aware of, but they build to the whole tonality, the whole emotional response of that film. So that, that's my moment. Oh, well, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start weeping. I've got a lump in my throat. Um, I, I, I think the specificity, uh, you know, the, he was so specific about where he was in 2017 and talking about it. And I think the bit that rings true to me is like his ideas of where he talk about a scene and this. And it's, and again, to reinforce, it's about narrative. It's about one shot at a time, one scene at a time. And the ideas that he had, it, it was in his head. In 2017, it was in his head already. And then, and then to to hear it then coming out in, in an Atmos mix, which is just um, it's incredible. But it's there, it's there. It's, they've you know the whole mix team have achieved an editor team have achieved what he had in his head, and to get an idea out of Jim's head and actually put that onto the screen, to put that into quantifiable effects mixed to music to emotion, that's that's the magic of it and then it's, and it's not too much it's delicate and it's and it's light and it's a light touch which 
which you know it, it's not about the the presence of noise as we said it's about the absence it's about an emotion and and that from 2017 to 2022 and it was there they got it out of his head somehow i have no idea surgery i don't know maybe <laughs> i have to let you go i could celebrate i i still can't believe like we're sitting here and having this conversation now and my brain was like how are you going to raise the bar from the original film to this one now and and you all did it you're true magicians at your craft this is such a well deserved nomination congratulations and enjoy celebrating it thank you very much thank you so much thank you